Good morning, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. Good, good, good. I was waiting for Facebook to get set up and it was taking its time. Um, oh, let's get the microphone in front of me. Forgot, we forgot the microphone. All right, all right, all right. We're good to go. Good morning, good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic Monday. I hope your weekend went well. I hope you won all the money. You'd rather win all the money than not lose all the money. I'm sure some of you out there had horrible sessions and I'm sure some of you out there had fantastic sessions. And unfortunately, or fortunately, you don't really get to pick how it goes. <laughs> sometimes you're gonna win, sometimes you are going to lose. So today, let's discuss something that I get asked almost every day. Something in effect of how do you know how many hands you beat and how many hands you lose to? How do I know if I should call or fold, essentially, right? Seems like a pretty easy question, but it actually is, well, it's actually not that hard as long as you know what to do. So we're gonna discuss counting combinations of hands, okay? Take a second, think about it. We're gonna discuss this. Jason said he played three and a half hours and made 12 big blinds, very nice, depending on how big the big blinds are. <laughs> um, Hunter won his first tournament ever, thanks to my coaching. Good, it's exactly what we're trying to have happen. Good, good, good. We want people out there winning. That said, again, you don't get to pick when you win. Um, okay. If you look at a poker hand grid, you'll see that you can have either the suited version of a hand or an offsuit version of a hand. But for each individual hand that is not paired, there are 12 combinations of it that are potentially available to be played. Okay? So what I mean by that? Say, take ace-king, for example. You can have ace-king of spades, hearts, clubs, or diamonds. It's four. It's four suited versions of each hand. Then you can have ace of spades, king of clubs, ace of spades, king of diamonds, ace of spades, king of hearts, ace of clubs, king of spades, ace of clubs, king of hearts, well, ace of clubs, king of diamonds, et cetera, et cetera, right? You go around, you round robin it, and you can get 12, right? So you have 12 combinations of offsuit hands, and four combinations of suited hands that are naturally available. Let's go ahead and preface this. But this is something that you normally need a PowerPoint to, to do very easily, to explain while you're talking and reading all the chat. So I may screw up the numbers a little bit. I'm going to try not to, though. So we know now that there are 16 possible combinations of each hand, four suited, four off-suited. Okay? Next, you want to ask, are any of these cards missing from the deck? Well, how can they be missing from the deck? Well, they could either be in your hand or they could be on the board, right? So say I raise with ace-king, my opponent calls, flop comes 9-7-2. How many combinations of ace-nine are there available? Let's just think about this. So in this scenario, we first want to ask, will our opponent play all ace-nines pre-flop. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. They'll play all ace queens pre-flop, but they may not play all ace nines pre-flop, right? So that means that you have to figure out their range to start with. It's like, say you raise under the gun and second position calls. Well, they may have no ace nines in the range at all because maybe they fold ace nine suited. Um, let's say you raise and button calls. They probably just have ace nine suited if they're competent, right? Let's say big blind calls. They're going to have all of the ace nines very often. So let's say you raise in the big blind calls. They have all the ace nines available. Flop comes nine, seven, two. How many ace nine combinations are available for the opponent? Spend, spend a second. Think about it. What do we know? Type your answer in the chat if you feel inclined. Well, we know there's an ace in our hand and we know there is a nine on the board. Okay. What you want to do is you want to count each unseen card that is different, and then you're going to multiply the seen cards, or the uh, available cards by the other available cards. What do we mean by this? How many aces are available? Well, we know we have ace-king in our hand, right? Our suits don't matter. We have an ace-king in our hand. So that means there are only three aces available, right? We also know there's a nine missing, because there's a nine on the board. That means there are three nines available. Okay, 
3 times 3, you multiply these two numbers, 3 times 3 gives you 9. So in this scenario, there are 9 ace-king combinations available. Right? So, good. Now we know that. That opponent's going to have three or 9 combinations of ace-9. What about king-9? Take a second, figure it out. Remember, we have ace-king, the board's 9-7-2. How many combinations of king-9 are available? Well, again, same story. We know that we know that there are three kings left, because one is in our hand. We know there are three nines left, which means three times three is nine. All right, good. What about um, queen nine, right? How many combinations of queen nine are available? Or it's nine, seven, two. We have ace, king in our hand. Spend a second. Think about it. Well, now it is three nines are available, right? Because the same thing, there's still one on the board. But now we don't know any of the queens. We don't know where they are. So there's four of those in the deck. Three times four is 12. So that's how you go about counting the combinations of each specific hand. Um, so let's discuss a few more instances. Say the board is 882, and the big one's in there. You may ask how many combinations of 86 are there. Let's say we have no eights and no, or how many combinations of each eight is there essentially? Assuming we don't block it with our hand, it's called blocking it when you have it, by the way. Assuming you're not blocking it, there are two eights remaining and then four of the other cards remaining. Two times four is eight. So there's eight combinations of each offsuit one. Realize though, that like on eight two, most people don't play eight three offsuit, an eight four offsuit, an eight five offsuit, right? Um, so often all of the combinations are not available. So what about when they're, the board is like, um, 999. Nine, nine. How many combinations of each nine is available? Well, there's only one nine left times the four kicker cards. So there's four combinations of each nine available. Okay? And that's how you go about doing this. We already did the three times three. That's if one's in your hand and one's on the board. What about three times two? How does that end up happening? So say there's two on the board. We already know that. So say the board is 882. And say we block a kicker. Right? Board is 882, and we're wondering how many combinations of ace 8 there are. And we have an ace king. So we know there are two eights left and three kings left. Two times three is six. So there's six combinations of each of those. Um, can we do three times one? I'm sure we can. Whatever. You get what I'm saying. You always want to count. How many unseed card of each card is there? And then multiply it by each other. So let's take a look at a very simple example really fast. I don't have this written down again, so I might screw it up. Let's say under the gun raises, we call on the button with ace nine suited. <laughs> there you go. Ace nine suited. Flop comes ace king four. All right. Our opponent bets. Fine. First things first. What is the opponent's pre-flop range? Well, if our opponent's good, he's going to have aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines, eights, right? Then he's going to have ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, offsuit maybe, ace, ten, suited, um, maybe lower suited aces, maybe not. They're going to have queen, jack, suited, queen, ten, suited, jack, ten, suited, ten, nine, suited, nine, eight, suited, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So let's presume our opponent's going to bet everything on the flop and we're going to call. Fine. We already know this. This is very obvious. They bet. We're not raising, because if we raise, we're probably going to get mostly value when we're beat. So they bet, we call. On the turn, they bet again. Now, now, now we figure out which hands are our opponent continue betting on ace, king, four, seven, right? We know they don't have ace, seven. Let's make it even better. Let's make it, like, it easy for ourselves. Ace, king, six, seven. We know they don't have ace, seven or ace, six suited. They may have the lower aces, but they would always check those on the turn for because it's a marginal hand. They'd always check a hand like king-queen on the turn. They'd always check pocket eights on the turn. So now, on the turn, they're literally only going to bet sets and two pairs for value. And they're going to bluff with queen-jack suited, jack-10 suited, and queen-10 suited. Okay? So, again, this is where it's nice to have a PowerPoint write all this stuff down. Maybe I'll write it down on my, on my own. All right, so, ace, king, six, seven. Okay, so now... They would bet pocket sevens on the flop if they had it as a bluff. So they have all combinations of sets available. Assuming they open sixes and sevens, let's presume they do to make life easy. How many combinations of each pair are there? 
Well, if there are none on the board, there are six available. If there's one on the board, there are three available. If there's two on the board, there's one available. Okay, you can trust me on that. You can get out some cards, figure it out, and um, go from there. So now they have three combinations of aces, three combinations of kings, three combinations of sixes, three combinations of sevens. That's 12 sets. All right. Now, how many combinations of ace king are available? Remember, we have ace nine. So that means they have two aces left and three kings left, right? Because there's an ace on the board, an ace in their hand, a king on the board. So there are two left times the three left. That means there are six ace king, and we know they can't have any other sets, all right? How many ace, not ace queens are available? We have an ace in our hand, there's an ace on the board, so two of them are gone. How many queens are available? Four, right? So there's two left times four, which is eight ace queen, eight ace jack, and we're gonna assume they have all those offsuits. Let's assume they check the ace 10 suited, which is probably smart. So those are all the hands we lose to. How many combinations do we lose to here with our ace nine? You add all of these up, we have 12 sets, six ace king, eight ace queen, eight ace jack. So that is 20 plus 14 is 34. 34 that we beat, that we lose to. We're assuming our opponent's gonna be reasonable, have good solid pre-flop ranges, and bet with a polarized range on the flop. The best hands they don't mind getting a lot of money in, and the bluffs. So what bluffs are there? Well, queen jack suited, jack 10 suited, and uh, queen, queen, ten, queen jack, queen 10, and jack 10 suited. So how many of each of those are available? We have none of those in our hand and there's none on the board, but they're only playing the suited versions, right? So there's four of each suited version. So we have three hands times four, four combinations each, that's 12 that we lose to, or 12 that we beat. So now we need to make a ratio. Let's get a calculator to make, make sure I have the math right. How many hands are there total in our opponent's range? 34 plus 12 is the total. 34 plus 12 is gonna be 46. So now, how many do we beat? There's 12 combinations of bluffs, so we do 12 divided by 46 total. Equals 26% that we beat, okay? Okay, fine. Now, let's presume our opponent bets the size of the pot on the turn. All right, what odds do we need to get to continue? Well, we're getting two to one pot odds, so we need to make sure we win 33% of the time. But, I just told you, we're only gonna win 26% of the time. So, in this scenario with ace nine suited, if your opponent is playing this strategy that I outlined, you should fold, right? Because you're only going to, you need to win 33%, you're only going to win 26%. Good. All right, next, let's presume our opponent bet a fifth pot. When your opponent bets a fifth pot, right, you, to figure out um, your pot odds, you do 0.2 divided by the pot plus their bet plus your call, divided by 1.4 pots total equals 14%. So now we need to win 14% of the time. So in this scenario, we should call. Right? So you can see, depending on the opponent's bet size, you should call with a wider or tighter range, right? Now, your opponent's um, hand range will likely change as they use different sizes. And to be fair, your opponent may be terrible and use just a specific size with each, each type of hand. Like for all, for all we know, whenever they bet small, they have exactly ace jack or ace 10, in which case you should fold, right? But we're presuming the opponent's good, and we're, we're making this a very simple example. We're presuming the opponent's going to use one bet size, right? Which actually could be fine in this scenario because your opponent may not want to be betting ace jack and ace 10 and like ace five suited here because if they bet those and you call, they're not really loving it. Usually you're going to find when your opponent uses a bigger bet size, they're more polarized. All right, let's take, um, let's take this example and jiggle it around a little bit. Let's presume our opponent doesn't bet ace jack on the turn, right? Now there are 26 combinations of value hands and still the 12 bluffs, right? 26 plus 12 is 38. 12 divided by 38 is what? Divided by 38 is 31%. So say the opponent checks their ace jack on the turn, as maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't, depending on how they expect you're going to play. And they bet the size of the pot. Well, now it's way closer, right? Because now 
you have the best hand 31% of the time, but you need to win 33%. So if they pot it, you should still probably fold. But if they bet like 80% pot, you should call. However, 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 understand that their bluffs actually have some equity, right? Remember, their bluffs are all gut shot straight draws. This is why it's very important to be bluffing with hands with equity. Um, because in this scenario, they just win like 8% of the time on the river when they make a straight. So in this scenario, you're going to need better than the obvious break-even odds of, let's say, if they pot at 33%. So you're, because sometimes, 8% of the time, or whenever they get the um, they get the straight, you just lose, right? This sounds like a topic for a webinar. This is a topic for a webinar. Here we are. I get asked this question a million times. I'm trying to give you a very simple example where we don't need to have it all written down. We do have it written down, though, to make sure I don't screw up. I think I actually tried this topic like four months ago, and I screwed it up a bit. Natty says, this math gets easier by using it. It absolutely does. Um, so anyway, in this scenario, it's important to understand that ace-9 is not actually in that great a shape. And that's because we assess the opponent's range. If we change this, though, and let's say cutoff raises, and then we call on the button, now cutoff has lots of ace-x that they may keep betting. So now we actually beat some of their value bets. And they have a lot more potential bluffs. Because remember, on ace, king, six, seven, now they have nine, eight and they have 10-8, and they have 10-9, and they have 8-5 suited, and they have 5-4 suited, right? So if the opponent's range gets much wider, ace-9 becomes a very easy call. Now, it's very important to ask, will they actually play as we are presuming they play? Someone asked earlier, what if they just play any two cards? Well, you need to figure out how they play their any two cards. Obviously, they don't bet all of it on the turn. That'd be ridiculous. And if they are betting literally any two cards on pre-flop and the flop and the turn, you just don't fold anything because they have way too much garbage, right? So that's that. Let's see. Fizzy says, without doing the math, just because of sizing, should you always do the math? Yes, of course you should. Because there are many, many spots where the opponent could very easily have a lot of bluffs. And they should be over bluffing, right? Like in um, this scenario right here, imagine I decided to bet all of my 10-9 suiteds, 8-7 suiteds, 9-7 suiteds. Imagine I just bet everything, all of my bluffs. Imagine I bet literally every possible bluff. Let's just go, let's take a second and go through here. We have 10-9 suited. We have 9-8 suited. Oh, we definitely have 9-8 suited, by the way, as a bluff. I forgot that on ace-king, 7-6. 9-8 suited will definitely bluff. So that adds um, more bluff combinations, right? They have, um, do we have 10-8 suited? No. This is kind of a difficult spot because there aren't actually that many potential bluffs. But let's add eight more combinations of bluffs to the opponent's range. 10-9 suited, 9-8 suited. Both of those are gut shots. Very easily could be good bluffs, right? So now we have 20. 20 hands that we beat. 20 divided by 38 is 55%, right? So now, if the opponent's not betting ace-jack and betting all of their draws, which they very likely should, now we're going to win half the time or more, right? Even if it was um, 20 divided... Actually, it's not 20 divided by 30. It's 20 divided by... Um, we just added eight more. So 20, 20 divided by 46, right? Still 45%, 40%, whatever it is. In that scenario, it's still way above 33% we should call. Um, similarly, if it was 46 and we have 20 divided by uh, 50, that's why we need to write this out. 20 divided by 50 something, it's still way, it's 40% now instead of 33 that we need, in which case we should call, right? So as you can see, your opponent's range and their strategy, strategy is vitally important. And in this scenario, it's not just opponent bet big so I should fold. It's is the opponent actually bluffing adequately? And you're going to find that a lot of people do bluff more than they quote unquote should. And you're going to find also that pre-flop and on the flop, I'm sorry, on the flop and the turn, you get to bluff with more bluffs if your bluffs have equity. Like I was saying here, right? If your opponent's betting with 10-9 suited and 9-8 suited, those actually have a decent chunk of equity, right? So... You, you do need to fold a little bit more often than you would think, but having the ace in your hand makes it very, very a much easier call, right? Um, notice if instead we had king-queen, we would not block quite as many hands. Or if we had king-eight suited, we not, would not block nearly as many hands. With king-eight suited, by the way, we actually block some of the opponent's bluffs. With ace-nine suited, we block some bluffs too. Don't forget that. You need to go through and you need to count those as well. Um, if you send a hand, well, I tell you what you play, how you played it. Sure, feel free to type it. Henderson says, you pay off too easily when your opponents have it. Yeah, well, sometimes that happens. You're a calling station. Well, don't do that. And you bluff too much. Well, don't do that either. <laughs> All right, so anyway, 
It seems like online you'd use your time bank fairly quickly and this would not be able to help you play. Understand that very rarely will you be able to do this within the 20 seconds they give you online. So what do you do? You study these spots. You should know, you should know that ace nine against an under the gun raise when they raise preflop and then they pot the turn in this scenario is a fold. You should also know that if cutoff raises or hijack raises and you call on the button or the cutoff, you should not fold because they have all the potential bluffs. Now again, you don't know if they're going to play all of the bluffs in this manner. This is the hard thing, right? Some people look at 10-9 and don't think it's a good bluffing hand, even though it is, because it has a gut shot. So it's very important to realize how your opponents are going to play specific hands. I mean, for example, if your opponent's just a weak, straightforward nit, pretty much every time they bet the turn, you should fold, because they're not bluffing, right? But if your opponent's a maniac, they're going to have way too many bluffs. So if they have way too many bluffs, then you have a very easy call. And again, you should not be raising with your marginal made hands. Whenever you have a bluff catcher, meaning you lose to all value hands, and in this example, an ace, king, seven, six, ace, nine loses to all value hands, you should essentially never raise. You should be doing a whole lot of calling. All right, Fred says, initially, do you just assume they play a certain way as far as ranges? I personally don't make huge assumptions. I try to weight the ranges, and I try to realize sometimes they're just lunatics, sometimes they're just nits. And I try to look at a few... A few um, likely scenarios. One is they just play well. The other is they are very nitty and they just have the nuts all the time. The other one is they're very loose and they have a lot of bluffs. Um, sometimes you just know they're not nitty, but they may be a maniac or they may be normal. Sometimes you know they're not a maniac just based on the way they're playing. So they may either be nitty or normal and that'll allow you to average it a little bit. Like for example, if in our in our situation here where if I knew my opponent was bluffing too much, I just never fold the ace nine. But if I knew the opponent was very, or either nitty or normal, I would certainly fold the ace nine. Also, you can generally try to figure out how the player pool plays in general, right? Um, some player pools are generally weak, tight, straightforward. Like small six cash games, a lot of players are generally weak, tight, straightforward, and that's fantastic. Aaron says, you won a main event seat two weeks ago, won the 20K at Venetian for 9,500, won an American Legion tournament, et cetera, et cetera. Good job, good work, Aaron. Thanks for everything I do. I'm awesome. I do my best to be awesome. I don't know if I am yet, but good job on your work and keep it up. Is this one of the things you do when studying your hand reviews? Absolutely, Sean. Absolutely. This is what poker is. When all the good players, by the way, you all may not be aware of this, but when all the good players are sitting there tanking, they're not just thinking, hmm, does he have it? No, they're counting combinations. This is what good players do. Now, again, there are some very common spots where you just know it's a fold. Like, for example, say you had king eight suited here. You just know it's a fold because you don't block the aces and you block some bluffs, right? So that's a very easy fold. Um, ace nine is a fold against under the gun. It is not a fold against the button. You just know this because you play these scenarios a lot, right? You know as your opponent's ranges get wider, you often need to stick around with more marginal hands. As the range gets tighter, you need to fold more marginal hands. As um, they're more inclined to bluff, you need to call a lot more. As they're less inclined to bluff, you need to fold a lot more. So that's important to realize that you learn these things by studying away from the table. This is exactly what we do at PokerCoaching.com and the homework challenges. Every month, I present a scenario. Let me tell you what we're doing this month. Let me pull it up. And I ask, how would you play your range? And the way you play your range is based on balancing your range first, but also taking into account how does your opponent play. I remember this month is a, it's a bit of a doozy. Everyone's going to not give this right the same answer I do. I can promise you on this one. All right, everyone folds you on the button. A loose, aggressive player raises two big blinds out of his 30 big blind stacks, so or kind of shallow stack in this one. Often we're deeper stacked, but people ask for shallow stack questions. Our small blind folds, we're in the big blind. What do we do with our whole range? This is how you need to be thinking about poker. Don't think, hmm, how do I play my king jack offsuit? No, think, how do I play my whole range? All right, suppose we call, which means we didn't re-raise. So we don't have aces anymore, or if, assuming we did re-raise with aces. We don't have our best hands because we re-raise those. We also don't have some bluffs because we bluff with those. All right, suppose we call. Flop comes king seven six. We check, the opponent bets two and a half big blinds. What do we do? Which hands do we call with? Which hands do we raise with? Which hands do we fold? And I'm asking people to give me all of that. How do they do it? Well, we have a program called the Poker Coaching Range Analyzer. They'll go through and count these combinations for you um, automatically. And it will also allow you to visually display your range based on whether or not you have a premium made hand, which you know you're never folding and you may raise, a marginal made hand, which you're very often calling, a draw, which you may or may not be raising or calling, or junk, which you're usually folding. So 
you would look at your range and try to balance it. And we discuss how to balance it at BoferCoaching.com. That's really the whole purpose of the homework challenge is to teach you how to play fundamentally sound. And all the students, they go through and they do this. They spend an hour or two going through this spot. And whenever they encounter this spot at the table, they're not going to be lost. They're going to actually have a pretty good idea of how to approach king 7 6 out of position. And king 6 5 and king 7 5 and king 8 6 and king 8 7, right? All these boards play relatively the same. And once you understand that, you'll know how to play a lot of these scenarios way better than if you just try to figure it out on the fly. Learning to play poker on the fly at the table is a really good way to lose a lot of money. <laughs> All right, so anyway, the next part of the question. Suppose we call. The turn is a two of spades, okay? We check. The opponent bets three big blinds. What do we do? Again, now, remember, you check call, the flop, so you don't have your raises. You also don't have your check fold, so your range gets tighter. So what do we do with our whole range again? This left. Then, suppose we call. The river is the ace of diamonds. Yuck. You check. The opponent bets six big blinds. What is our strategy? Now, again, which hands do we raise? Which hands do we fold? Which hands do we call? And you do all this keeping minimum defense frequency in mind, keeping range advantage in mind, and you'll end up with a chart. You'll end up with a range chart that will essentially have you, in this scenario, spoiler alert for all the people who are going to be in the, in the quiz, or in the, in the homework challenge at the end of this week on Friday, you're calling down with a lot of middle pairs. It's not ideal, but if you do play in a fundamentally sound matter, manner, hands like 10-6 on king 7 6 to ace is a check call on the flop, a check call on the turn, and a check call on the river. Assuming your opponent plays well. And remember, this opponent's a little loose and aggressive, right? And if your opponent's a little loose and aggressive, you should actually be calling down wider than normal. And um, on the river as well, which hands should you raise? What are the, even the potential raising hands, right? Funny enough, in this scenario, it's also bottom pairs. Because you didn't get to the river with any total garbage. You must have a pair when you get to the river in this manner. And you also want to raise with your two pairs in this scenario. So, find some bluffs. Which hand should you be bluffing? Right? Which combinations are best to bluff? This is the kind of thing we do over PokerCoaching.com. All the students do this. And I go through about 20 of the answers that are all relatively different in a live webinar that takes four hours. Right? And this is very, very important. Clint says you have to go change your answer. No, don't change it, right? I'm going to explain to you why, why your answer is not right. <laughs> okay. So that is how you go about counting ranges and using it at the table because that's going to allow you to have a way better idea of what your opponents are doing and how they are playing and how you should adjust to take advantage of it. Let's see. Vin says... You call in the big blind with king five suited, flop comes king eight five, he bets, or sorry, you check, he bets, you raise a 9k, turns an ace, you checked, he bets 7500, you call, rivers a queen, you checked, he went all in, you call. That's probably fine. Um, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah, the guy, you lose to a lot of combinations here, but you have one of the best hands in your range. This is a spot where you probably should fold out um, a lot of, like, king queen, king jack type hands. But in this scenario, um... It's unfortunate, but because it was a button raise, button's not going to have a whole lot of ace-king and ace-queen. They're going to have a lot of ace-x as well that may feel inclined to value that. Also, it depends on how big the all-in is, right? If the all-in's 100,000 chips into a small pot, well, obviously you fold. If it's, if it's 20,000 chips into an 80,000 pot, or 20, yeah, 20 into an 80k pot, you obviously call. So it depends a lot on the scenario and the odds are being laid. It's amazing how we visualize this stuff. I mean, listen, I have a lot of practice. We do a homework challenge every month. Poker coaching's been around for a few months, and I've done many of these on my own, a few months, a few years. <laughs> and I do all of this on my own, away from the table, too. And that's how you learn to do this, right? This should, once you study all of the spots, and really there are only, I don't know, a thousand spots that are comparable. Remember, king 8 7, king 7 6, king 7 5, all these are kind of the same. Um, and like queen something something is kind of related. Jack XX is way more related to Queen XX and King XX, obviously. But anyway, all these spots are related. And once you understand how to play related spots decently well, because you sit down away from the table and do it, now you don't have to guess, right? So many people are stuck guessing because they just don't know what they're doing. They haven't studied away from the table. And they don't even approach poker from the right, in the right way. They think, how do I play my ace-king? As opposed to, how do I play my range? Whenever, whenever I get a new member on poker coaching, probably one out of 20 times, they send an email saying, I see the homework question. I think there's a typo. You didn't say your hand. 
it shows that they are relatively new to thinking about ranges. And that's that's not uncommon. So many players, especially small stakes players who just don't have much experience studying poker, they really don't think about ranges. And this is eye-opening, and it makes them go pretty quickly from being marginal players to actually decent players because their entire thought process gets changed to the way that is optimal enough. Now, um, essentially what we're trying to do is mimic the game theory optimal programs in a way that is implementable. It's very important to realize. You want to make sure whatever strategy you are using is implementable. And while you can be very concerned with balance, with um, mixing up ranges, having different bet sizes, et cetera, et cetera, that will give you an extra few percent edge, but it's absolutely not necessary to beat the vast majority of games. Now, again, I want to make it clear. When you're playing against bad players, someone asked earlier, what if your opponent plays anything? Well, just call with all your bluff catchers, right? If you know the opponent does something obviously incorrect, take advantage of it. If they're super nits, fold everything. If they're lunatics, call with everything. And that should be very obvious. But what if your opponent's just kind of aggressive? Well, you shouldn't call with everything. You should call with some a little bit more often than normal. And the problem with not understanding the strategies that we're discussing here is that you won't know what a little more often than normal is, right? Like, let's say with ace-nine here, it's close. Okay? So maybe, maybe ace-nine's a call in our, in our first example on ace-king, seven-six. If our opponent's a little bit loose and aggressive. Okay, what about if we have ace-four? Is ace-four a call? Probably. What about if we have king-queen? Maybe, right? And this is where it's important to understand where the cusp is. Because imagine the cusp is actually ace-jack offsuit, but now calling a king-queen against this slightly more aggressive player is probably a big leak. But if your opponent's a lunatic, well, all everything becomes a bluff catcher, and you get to catch with everything. What if your opponent's a little bit tight? What if ace-jack or ace-ten is the cusp? Well, now ace nine's an easy fold, ace-ten's a fold, ace-jack's a fold. What about bottom two pair? Where is the cusp, right? And that's what you have to try to figure out. Like, how much are you actually going to adjust to try to exploit the opponent? And you need to know where the rough lines are drawn so that you can then adjust from there. The problem with not understanding that type of thing is that you're just making arbitrary decisions. Like, yeah, I should call more than normal. Like, yeah, what's normal, right? Let's see. Fernando says, the poker coaching homework has taught you how to study. Good. An answer you've been searching for for a very long time. Yeah, a lot of people don't, um, don't know how to do it. Joseph says, most of the forum posts online start with playing a hand and never discuss ranges. It's true. Because most people want to know, how do I play my exact spot as opposed to how do I play and succeed long term? I'm ignoring all of your chat. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. You all are typing a million things today. Um, you've been fine. Uh, been playing five to ten tables, but not doing it well. Play fewer tables. John says you just joined poker coaching. It's a little overwhelming. If it's overwhelming to you, go back to the very oldest homework challenge. The first four or five or six homework challenges are really more of an onboarding process to get you used to thinking about ranges like this. That is definitely going to be the way to go about doing it. Spend some time. It's going to take some time. We have a ton of content there, but it will make you way, way, way better at poker and understanding it. The other day in the Inner Circle webinar, I told Mark, you're too loose preflop and you're not free betting enough. Yeah, a lot of people are too loose preflop and not free betting enough. If you're playing at this level, but your competition is only thinking about the game based on their cards, is playing at this level beneficial? Yes, because you don't know what cards they have and you don't know how they think. The nice thing about what we teach at PokerCoaching.com is you can put a blindfold on and literally have no clue who your opponent is, have no clue what they're doing, and you're either going to roughly break even or win. Assuming if they're playing perfectly GTO, yeah, you're probably going to lose a little bit, but they're not. And if they are doing something wrong, but you don't know what they're doing wrong, you're still going to win because they are so far away from GTO that you're just going to crush them because you're at least somewhat close to it. Let's see. How do you play in tournaments where the blinds go up fast? Learn to play very good shallow stack poker. Don't think it's a it's a bingo game like a lot of people think it's not. There's a huge edge to be had. You have to study. If you guys are serious, sign up to poker coaching and start with challenge number one, says Clint. I completely agree. Um, let's see. Let's see. 
You started losing a few years ago. You think it was because more players started thinking this way. Yeah, well, people get better over time. That's what happens to games. You used to read people and eat their, eat their lunch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fortunately, reads are still very important. Um, like, imagine we know our opponent's perfectly balanced, right? But, you know, because you can look and tell that they're bluffing a lot. Or maybe they just appear a little bit weaker than normal. I know Dale Negreanu talked about this in his podcast recently. It's called DAT Poker Podcast, D-A-T. D-A-T Poker Podcast. And he's going through hands from a high roller tournament saying he had reads on these players and he thought they were a little bit weaker than normal. And these are the best players in the world. And Negreanu is one of the best people readers in the world, right? That is a big edge. And, you know, he's smart enough to realize, all right, what I was doing before, just only reading people's not working. I need to make sure that I learn to play fundamentally sound. And then he did exactly what I'm suggesting you all doing. You do. And his reading ability allows him to make slight adjustments, or maybe you can just tell the guy's bluffing, in which case that's when you make that big adjustment and you crush them. But usually you're not going to have any great reads if your opponents are decent, or if you aren't a great reader. I mean, I don't think I'm a great people reader. I'm certainly not overly skilled at it. You're going to find most people who came from online poker are not overly skilled at reading players, and that's okay, right? So you do the best with the skills and the traits that you have. You work on the skills that you don't have. I've certainly worked a lot on reading people, but I'm not some super genius at it, right? And so you use this, the skills and the traits that you have. But reading people is definitely an a important skill that you should do your best to try to learn. And um, the neat thing about the high roller terms is you can actually watch a lot of footage on people. And if you don't play them a ton, they're going to have no footage on you or little footage about you. And that's, that's incredibly valuable, right? Because you know what they do and they have no clue what you do. Eventually they'll figure it out though. Um, you're saying if you're playing in a basic games where the winners are betting and raising, the losers are checking and calling. I mean, if, if your opponents are playing in a specific manner that is obviously bad, you're just going to demolish them. And there are certainly times, by the way, where let's say your opponent raises 777 preflop and they only do that with pocket sevens. Well, obviously life is easy, right? If people do really, really, really bad things, you're going to crush them. But as you move up to even slightly more than tiny stakes, it's not that easy. Um, let's see. When should you opt for a min-raise instead of a shove in a tournament when you're on 15 big blinds? Um, I'm a pretty big fan of having a min-raise, shove, or fold strategy. It's not min-raise everything or shove everything. You get to min-raise, shove, or fold at about 10 big blinds or more from early position at about 12 big blinds or more from late position. Um, and usually you're min-raising your absolute best hands and you're min-raising some stuff that's not quite good enough to shove and then you're shoving the hands that don't play particularly well. Is the math the same in a bounty tournament? Well, no, you have to figure out how much the bounty is worth in terms of actual equity. Sometimes the bounty's worth not a lot, sometimes the bounty's worth a ton. Like in progressive bounty tournaments, quite often the bounty's worth 10 buy-ins. Well, like obviously you should be trying to get the 10 buy-ins, assuming the pot is only worth five buy-ins, right? But if, the bounty, if you're playing like a $100 plus $20 bounty, the $20 bounty is kind of irrelevant. I have a blog post somewhere on my blog, I don't know the link, where I discuss how to figure out the value of a bounty and also like a hand example. KK, K Kep says, middle position opens to 2K, button calls, you call big blind, queen, nine off suit. All right. 10, 8, 7, no suits, big blind. I'm oh, sorry, you check, middle position, bets 3,500, button call, or button calls. Don't know how deep we are, but this is a spot we can definitely raise or jam. Calling's also fine because of the good odds. Turns a queen. Check, check, button bets 10K, easy call again. Um, you say you don't love your pair. I mean, queen's pretty good here. Queen and draw is pretty good, so I would, I would call again. Or maybe raise, but probably call, almost certainly call. In a cash game, what spot goes are good for delayed continuation bets? Usually when you have a hand that's just total trash. Um, for example, say you raise... I don't even know. Say you raise 5-4 um, suited, big blind call, or button calls. It comes queen-jack-2, right? Queen-jack-2. It's a horrible flop for you. You should check fold. Say it goes check-check and you turn it into sort of gut shock or open into straight draw, you should definitely bet. Even if you miss, you should strongly consider betting as well. Obviously, having equity is better than not having equity, though. When you, hit, when you play and you don't have a playable hand for two hours, what should you do with a short stack? Sit there and keep folding. Maybe steal here and there. Learn that you can min-raise and go from there. All right. 
a big thank you as an order. Your roll is miserable. <laughs> it's been between zero and 30 bucks in the past three days. You have doubled your roll. Good job, good work. That's on you for doing the hard work and studying. I'm just here to help all of you out. Your videos pay off. That, that's, that's the purpose. My goal is to teach all of you to get better at poker so you can win money and change your life. I understand having a pile of money is very useful, and I want to make sure that you all get a hold of that. Um, okay, let's see what else I have written down about counting combinations. Very important. Is the hand actually in your opponent's range? So important. Um, for example, let's say, but middle position raises, you call on the button, flop comes queen jack two, and the opponent checks. What's the opponent's strategy? If they're a good player, they're going to do a whole lot of checking here because they're out of position. Out of position on a board that should be favored, the button is pretty strong right? So that's pretty bad for you. So you need to do a lot of checking. So you don't, you can't necessarily discount stuff like bottom set here or two pair or top pair good kicker, even if they check call, right? That said, some people always bet their best hand. Some people don't. So you need to figure that kind of thing out. Um, realize that offsuit hands often don't exist in a range, especially if it's early position ranges. Like for example, say you raise early position and early position also calls. They don't have base 10 offsuit if they're competent, right? So figure that out. Um, realize that different combinations are in play based on position and starting hand ranges, right? If um, you raise cutoff and I'm on the button, my button range is going to be way wider than if you raise under the gun and I call because your range started off tighter if you're under the gun and wider if you're on the, in the cutoff. So that's very important. Joel says, why is the cutoff called the cutoff? I have no clue. Um, Google it. If I had to guess... Because it's the last seat you actually get to play a decent, or the seat where you actually get to play a decent amount of hands. But I don't know, I don't know the answer. Someone Google it and let me know. Gavin says, faced with a big blind, faced with a wait, min raised, facing an all in from the big blind. Is that always a call or fold? Gavin, I have no clue what spot you're talking about. Your range is very important. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right. Um, that's pretty much it. If you all miss how we, how we go through discussing how to count combinations, definitely go back and rewatch this video. I think it's a very useful one. I'm probably not going to do this, um, too much in the near future, the discussing counting combinations, but probably every six months I'll do it. <laughs> there's, there's the bounty link. Thank you, JJ Pregler. I appreciate it. Cause you hand on Wednesday with minimum defense frequency. Fernando, understand minimum defense frequency does not always matter. Um, well, hey, you can do the poker coaching homework this, this week and you will likely see. Let me make sure I discuss that on this week, this month's poker coaching homework. I think I do discuss it, but let's take a look. Um, it's fine to overfold. Good. Yeah, so in this scenario, I actually discuss overfolding. Um, we discuss minimum defense frequency and how it's fine to fold a little bit more often than you should on king something something because you just don't have a lot and you were getting good pot odds to defend preflop. So understand, minimum defense frequency very often does apply preflop, very often does apply on the river, kind of applies on the flop, kind of applies on the turn, um, but it definitely applies on the river and preflop. So those are spots where you want to make sure you're very, very well defended. Been looking at a lot of poker training sites. Poker coaching is absolutely the best. Well, listen, I made a training site that I would have liked to have as a young person and even I like to have now. I and mean, I, I still go through quizzes by the other coaches because I, I learn a lot doing them, right? I don't need to go through my own quizzes because I spent time making them. <laughs> but I do go through lots of other people's quizzes and, and I learned a lot. I mean, I, I made a site that I wanted to learn from. And I tried to give that all to you too. And I made a free trial so that all of you could try it, right? Because I want you to all see completely for free that it is beneficial and that you'll learn a lot from it. Two big blinds left, five from the money, ace eight suited in late position, insta shove. Um, John, it depends on how many people are left in the tournament, right? Very, very important topic. If, if there are 5,000 people left in the tournament and five more have to bust, you should obviously fold. If there are seven people in the tournament and you're five from the money, it's an easy shove, right? Also, the stack sizes are very relevant. If the stack sizes are um, all two big blinds, you know, maybe it becomes a little bit closer to a fold. Fizzy says time bank to the money. Yeah, it depends on how long, how far away you are from the money, though, right? Fred says 300, 600, one limper, 
You race 1,800 with nines. Definitely race bigger. Definitely race like 2,400. Under the gun calls. Oh, with only 2,500 behind. I mean, put put him, make make it a little bit more. Make it like 3K, just to get his money in. Flop comes queen seven three. he goes all in, easy call. If you fold there, you're folding way more often than you can. Discussing um, minimum defense frequency there, you need to call like ace high, so don't fold there. You expect to lose a bit when starting in cash games. You should expect to lose a bit. Oh, you mean at the beginning of a session? No. Don't sit there and give away money to develop an image because you don't know how long your image is going to last, right? Also, some people are oblivious. Some people don't care. The idea of I'm going to play, I'm going to do something wrong to try to develop an image is ridiculous, in my opinion. Unless you know you're going to play with these people for a very long time, like a year, and you know they're going to assume from one or two or three instances of play that you are terrible. And that's a lot of assumptions. And, and you also have to assume that they're going to adjust in the way that you think they're going to adjust, right? So there's just a lot of stuff that has to happen, right, for you to justify playing poorly to try to develop an image. Instead, just be cognizant of what is happening. Say you sit down and you just get a lot of good cards and they don't get shown down. They're going to think you're loose and aggressive. Okay, keep that in mind, right? Or say you just get no playable hands. All right, they're going to think you're a nit, so keep that in mind. But the idea of I'm just going to do something abhorrently bad doesn't make sense. You may want to do something that is um, a low-frequency play. Now, this is what a lot of very good players will do. Um, imagine, let's say you're supposed to run a bluff with a backdoor flush draw on the flop every time, and then you're supposed to bet it on the turn when you miss like 5% of the time. Maybe you run that high-frequency bluff right at the beginning of the session because it's like it's not terrible. You should do it sometimes. If you do it more than 5%, you're doing it too much. But um, still fine, right? So you can do low-frequency plays. First impressions are big. Most people's judgment come from that. Yeah, if they're bad. I definitely agree that most people will lean way too much on first impressions. But unfortunately, first impressions are often kind of irrelevant. And the problem with poker is you just don't get that much information. Like, say someone raises the first four hands. You don't know if they just got good hands or reasonable hands, right? Um, say they folded the first four hands. It doesn't mean they're knit. Say they run some huge bluff right off the bat. It could be fine. It doesn't mean they're a lunatic, right? It's not like the person sits down and honestly announces, all right, I'm going to go all in blind every hand, and it goes all in blind every hand. People just don't do that, right? Um... Fred says, you did call in that spot on queen something something. He had ace seven. I guess that's middle pair. He said, you wouldn't have called earlier. He was way too nitty. Yeah, easy call. Easy, easy, easy call. Any transitions from sit and go to cash games? I would definitely recommend transitioning from sit and goes to tournaments first because sit and goes are often played relatively shallow stacked. Um, any book recommendation for that? Though? I mean, just you need to study the other game. Realize you should not transition from one game to another. You have to realize they are different games. So the idea of I'm going to play limit holding to transition and warm up to play no limit next is asinine, okay? They're different games. Sit and goes are different games than no limit holding tournaments. But it's the most related one. Um, I actually lost a ton of money, $100,000 or more, when I first started playing poker. Well, you know, when I turned 21. So when I started playing live poker by playing a roughly sit and go strategy in multi-table tournaments. Because it's a different game, right? And one need to get in the top 30% of the field and the other need to get in the top 2% of the field. So I lost 100K, learning. Fortunately, I was so good at sitting goes I had 100K to lose. But it's obviously not ideal, and it's very important to realize cash games are a different game than tournaments. Obviously, they're comparable. Deep stack tournaments, deep stack cash games are comparable. But they're certainly not like very, very, very the same. It's where you learn one, you just know the other. Which is why you hear a lot of cash game players talking about how tournament players are bad at cash games. A lot of tournament cash game players talk about how tournament player, or cash game players are bad at tournaments. Because they're different games. All right, let's see. Question about poker coaching. If you sign up for a year, do you get to pick your 10 training videos as a bonus? Um, if that is what is said, then yes, you do. Always, if you have any question questions about um, pokercoaching.com, send us an email to support at pokercoaching.com. Chetta says you have to pay tuition to change games, LOL. I, I know this is a joke, but actually it is very, very not true. Because what you really need to do is you need to study. I made the blunder of thinking that tournaments and sit and goes are all the same. And they're not. And it cost me $100,000. I don't want all of you to lose $100,000. So learn from my mistake. I'm telling you right here, 
All the games are different and you need to spend significant time realizing they're not different and study accordingly. Uh, let's see. You never used to play cash games, but now you're crushing them. Good. Is there an app for taking notes? Not one that I have. I use a paper and a pen. What's the way to, best, what's the way to practice when you live in the no poker state? Play online. I think you can figure out a way to play online. JonathanLowPoker.com slash USA lists all of my recommendations for that. Spoiler, there aren't many, but they do exist. You say education is not cheap usually. Understand that I think the most intelligent thing you can do is learn from the mistakes of others. It's hard to learn from the mistakes of other those, others though because you did not experience the pain. You all did not lose $100,000 in a year of your life. I did. I learned that lesson very, 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 very well. All <laughs> right. When you, when, you, when you really feel penalties and losing a lot of time, a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, you learn. And I wish there was a way for me to transfer the pain onto you. Um, I've learned a lot of life lessons that were all very costly, and all I can do is tell you about them and hope that you listen. How do you get patches again? Email support at pokercoaching.com. Anytime you have any question that you don't think I will very clearly know the answer to, please email support at pokercoaching.com. 5% of the population, or 0.5% of the population can't afford to lose $100 yet, alone 100K. You say afford, you can't afford to lose 100K ever, at least I can. Um, it's like a third of my money. I lost a third of my money due to being ignorant. And I'm telling you all, don't be ignorant. Learn from other people's mistakes, learn from the past, learn from what other people have done, and you'll be way better off. For example, don't keep a whole lot of money in these online poker sites that operate within America, unless it's licensed within America. Because they may take your money. How do I know? I actually dodged Black Friday. I dodged having all my money locked up. But a lot of my friends had money locked up or taken by the sites for years. And I would hate for you all to experience that. But from hearing a lot of you talk about how, oh, this online site's safe. They're operating great for the last two years. Yeah, well, don't be shocked when you get hosed and feel the pain. Hopefully you can learn from my pain. But everyone's not going to learn from the pain of those who have already been through it. Can you get a patch just for playing at the local casino? Yeah, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. If you're a poker coaching member, we will send you patches. We have patches. There's one right here. Hope this is not going to... Ah, that's good. So I hope it's not going to leave some sticky on my, on my wall. Do you have an insider tip? I have no insider tips. I have no insider information. But I have years of experience, and I have studied history. <laughs> Am I going to sport a beard in the World Series? Is this a beard? I just haven't shaved in two days. This is not a beard. You say Blair Hinkle got hosed. Yeah, I have a fun story for that. So right before Black Friday, um, I was playing on a turn in a tournament in full on full tilt, and I took second place out of like I don't even know how many people it was two thousand people in a thousand dollar buy-in tournament for three hundred twenty k. That was lucky. Um, I knew myself. I had learned from my past as well, and I know they have very big games on full tilt. I'm happy to play very big games where I think they're soft, but I really didn't want to lose three hundred k. So I had a contact at Full Tilt. They were friendly with me. They said, yeah, we'll cash you out, no problem. So they sent me 300K. It appeared in my account two days before Black Friday. Then Black Friday happened. Um, Blair Hinkle won the same tournament the next week. They were doing like a $1,000 buy-in multi, like six entry tournament. Um, so he won it the next week, didn't get his money. I guess he got like 700K or something. And then he was locked up for forever. Um, I did a decent amount of buying of, of locked up funds which worked out very well. How did I know to do this? Well, I studied the company that bought, that um, essentially was in charge of distributing the funds. Now, this is maybe a story for later. Anyway, I bought a bunch of money at 50 cents on the dollar, knowing I was going to wait two or three years, 10 years at the most, and you'll get it all back, right? And that was an opportunity that presented itself because other people, well, Blair kind of just got screwed, right? But a lot of other people, they had their money on there and they just have their whole bankroll on there. If you have your whole bankroll on there, you just can't not have your money for 10 years, right? And um, something else I've learned. It's important to have cash on hand because you never know what opportunities are going to fall in your lap. And often you need to have some cash to capitalize. Uh, let's see. Learning to play loose aggressive properly is unbelievably frustrating and can be incredibly costly. Well, study before you actually do it. Don't just sit down and try to do it. Do you buy pieces of other poker players in the World Series? Sometimes.
All right, I think we're out of time. What time is it? Yeah, we are out of time. Hope you all have a good day. Hope you enjoy yourselves. Look for opportunities. Learn to count combinations. Learn to count combinations. <laughs> I'm like Teddy KGB, paying them with their money. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. I've decided to get back in the gym before the World Series. I've decided two things I'm going to do. You're all going to have to hold me to it. I'm going to get into the gym pretty hard between now and the World Series. We have about three weeks between now and when I go back. And then we're going to go through the World Series for two weeks. And after that, I'm going to come back. I'm going to have a week where not a whole lot's going on. I'm going to do very likely a one-week fast, maybe five-day fast. As long as I've ever fasted, it's been three days. I'm getting a little fat boy here. Um, so we will maybe do a fast. Actually, we're going to do a fast. And um, between now and then, I'm probably also going to start skipping lunches. I think it's probably good for you. Seems a little bit crazy, but we're going to be doing it. Have the solvers changed how people play? Lag and tag. I mean, understand that the solvers explain when you should play lag slash tag. The idea of lag slash tag is kind of antiquated to begin with because really what's important are frequencies and tendencies in specific spots. All right, so anyway, I'm going to be done here. I'm going to reply to an email or two, then I'm going to the gym. Hope you all have a great day. Good luck. Enjoy your games. Take care of your minds, your bodies, your spirits. And I will, um, I'll be back. Look into intermittent fasting. So I don't know if this is, I guess it's not obvious. I actually didn't really realize people do this. A, a lot of people like eat at nighttime. They eat through the night and all this stuff. We eat dinner at 6 p.m. And we do not eat again until 6, until 7 a.m. Every day. That's just like what I've done for years. <laughs> I can't even remember the last time I had food after like 8 p.m. Unless I'm like out at a party or something, which almost never happens because I don't have very many friends. <laughs> um, and then our breakfast is just a green smoothie. It's just blended up vegetables. So breakfast is like 150 calories of blended vegetables. So I usually don't have a meal until lunch. But we're going to start skipping those lunch meals. I'm going to have vegetable broth or bone broth instead. Um, so we're eating one meal a day, essentially. We're going to have a 200 calorie smoothie in the morning. We're going to have a 20 calorie soup for lunch. And we're going to have a nice big dinner at 6 p.m. And um, one meal a day results in 24 hour fasting. <laughs> 23 hour fasting each day. They claim it's good, it'll save time. I, I actually skipped meals, I skipped lunch every day last week. I think I was complaining to all of you about it and I, I got a lot done because you don't have to spend 30 minutes dealing with food, it's nice. What blender do I use? I use a NutriBullet. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's the, what's it called? I think it's called a NutriBullet. It's the good version of whatever that um, brand is. I don't know what that brand is, but anyway, it's a nice high powered one, it, it blends up green smoothie no problem the green smoothie i make for those asking spinach kale romaine lettuce parsley carrots a little bit of blueberries chia seeds and water that's it my jumping on the vegan bandwagon i do order from a vegan restaurant a lot uh, there's a good vegan restaurant right down the street i like to get their bean sprouts i like to get their kimchi soup they call it pumpkin gazpacho it's actually super spicy kimchi soup it's very good um, but no, I'm definitely not a vegan. Probably should be though. Don't really have any good excuse not to be. Don't, doesn't sound like enough calories. Yeah, yeah, it does not sound like enough calories. We're gonna have a big dinner. We're gonna have lots and lots of food at dinner. We're gonna load up. Load up at our 6 p.m. dinner. Um, okay, we're going now. Goodbye, have fun, good luck. I'll talk to you again on Wednesday.